It seems to me that what we really have to do is to actually reframe the approach in which we're currently using in addressing climate change because the existing mechanisms are not going to get us to the point we've got to get to. So how do we refine it? And to me, there are two critical issues in what the Club of Rome is trying to do that are different. What is the point of difference that we can offer the world that is not just another list of all the good things that should actually happen? And it seems to me there are two things. One is the fact that this is an immediate existential risk. And secondly, that we cannot actually solve it unless we adopt an emergency approach. It's not going to get solved with what we currently have in place. I'll just quickly run through a few things, some of which um, we touched on, and I'll skip through some of these slides. But the overall picture that we've got, I think, coming out of Paris, um, we've seen one degree warming. The Paris limit, we know about two and uh, 1.5. 1.5 is probably already in the system, as John said. The um, emission pathways, the index, will get us to 3 plus, probably. And the current pathway we're on will end up with 4 plus. And what we're seeing is already major changes at those levels. We probably have got irreversible change in the West Antarctic ice sheet and possibly the Arctic sea ice. Two degrees is probably the boundary of extremely dangerous climate change. Not dangerous, that's pretty much happening today. Um, looking at what military experts say, not so much the scientists, but the, some of the best national security people around the world, three degrees will be a world basically of outright chaos. And four is probably incompatible with any organized global community. So that's what we're actually facing today. And the problem I have with a lot of the discussion that's going on is that we are not talking about this. It doesn't actually come up in very blunt terms. And, problem, and having worked in high-risk operations most of my life, the first thing you have to do to solve a problem is be honest about what that problem actually is. So why is it an immediate existential risk? Well, firstly, what does existential mean? And it's basically a risk posing large, permanent large negative consequences to humanity, which can never be undone. An adverse outcome that's either going to annihilate intelligent life or permanently and drastically curtail its potential. Not easy words, but we need to actually recognize that that is what is being said. And an emergency response if, is essentially, if we're going to manage that, I think it's been enough evidence put forward this morning that that indeed is the case. The markets are important, but they're not going to solve it in isolation. Um, regulation is going to be needed, and it's going to have to be very different from the sort of regulation we tend to think about in conventional market systems and, and, uh, and corporate um, national activities. What's the rationale for all of that? Well, firstly, we're already seeing dangerous climate change, as I said, at one degree C. To stay below two, we're going to have to peak emissions by 2020, then reduce them extremely rapidly, and 1.5 even more rapidly. And at the moment, they're going up, going up in line with worst-case scenarios. The carbon budgets we touched on, I think John mentioned 66% chance or whatever, is not particularly good odds for what really amounts to the future of humanity. If you up the ante to 90%, which in engineering terms is still not very good, you wouldn't get on a plane to London with a 10% chance of uh, you know, failure. But at 90%, there's no carbon budget left today um, to meet two degrees C, let alone one and a half. Climate inertia means that the continuing fossil fuel investments, if you listen to the chief executives of the major oil companies around the world, we're going to be here for decades to come, and fossil fuels, yes, will get phased out, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. Those investments in the absence of a carbon budget because of climate inertia, which we don't see the full results of for some decades, are going to lock in the type of existential outcome that we don't want. And we have the, the aerosols point John raised. We're going to see, as we clean up the atmosphere, another 0.3 to 0.5 degrees C temperature increase in a one-off sense. 
which is going to make the uh, compounding of the problem of staying below those warming limits. And the Paris solutions finally rely on the negative emission technologies to remove carbon. They're non-existent at scale today, and yet we're placing enormous weight on the fact that they will get us out of trouble. And I, I would suggest that's uh, extremely dangerous, and it just creates a totally false sense of security um, that they're easy solutions when we actually don't have any. Now, that's the situation we're actually in, and you therefore really have to refocus. Um, and what that says to me is it's impossible now to stay below 1.5, whatever we do, and probably below 2 unless we really get our act together in a way that nobody has thus far seriously talked about, um, with a desire to really see much more fundamental change than I think um, is in the current dialogue. Sensible risk management addresses risk before it actually happens. And that time, frankly, is now. If we don't start to use those techniques, then uh, really you can forget solving climate change. And risk management won't work in the way that conventional markets actually look at it. If you're talking about existential risk, it's not a question of the type of uh, risk management that financial markets use and so on. You really have to say, look, we're here today. We have to get there tomorrow. How do you do it? And that's a completely different approach from the one that uh, is in the current discussions. So you can s you're told very frequently that, look, you can't say these sort of things. It scares the horses. You shouldn't do it psychologically. It's all wrong. In my experience, that actually is, is, is completely the worst thing you can do. You've got to be honest about the problem. You have to normalize the fact in our thinking that that is what we're facing. You have to socialize it so it gets discussed as a normal course of events. And we then have to use that as the basis for planning and action. And unless we do that, then I think we're going to go, continue to go around and around in circles. So really what we want out of this um, is cl global collective action rather than conflict to become the norm. At the moment, I think we're headed in the latter direction. And we really have to change that dialogue. The priorities, I won't uh, go into these in detail because um, <coughs> Anders has basically touched on them. But I think what we're trying to do with this initiative is to make the point that the, the two real points of difference are one, the existential risk, two, the fact you have to take an emergency response. And the question then is, well, how are you actually going to make this happen? Because we have all these lists, we've all looked at them, we've all tried to do it. What we hope the Club of Rum can do is really act as a catalyst to bring a lot of these disparate groups together. There's tremendous good work being done, but it's not against the fact that those are the real issues we've got. So what we would hope is to act as a mechanism to initiate that discussion and start a different sort of approach to trying to solve the entire problem. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you so much, Ian.